every time I look at this view of the All Saints Bay, I remember the many years that I lived in this city. Ever since I lived in the United States, I wanted to go to Salvador. Due to the importance that Abdul Baha gave to this city in the tablets of the Divine Plan. Visit ye, especially the city of Bahia, on the eastern shore of Brazil, because in past years this city was christened with the name Bahia. There is no doubt that it has been through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I participated in the Baha'i Convention in New York in 1919 when we received the Tablets of the Divine Plan. From there, immediately I wrote to Abdul Baha, expressing my desire to go pioneering. In his reply, he expressed the hope that I may become a spiritual physician. This hope the master became my highest aspiration. In the following year, 1920, I read his tablet to Martha Root, expressing his joy at her teaching work in South America and stressing the importance that others follow it up. At once I understood that this could be the task for me I wrote to Martha Root, and immediately she encouraged me. She told me about a group of three young theosophists whom she had met in Santos, who asked that someone come to teach them more about the Baha'i faith. That someone could be me. But the decision to travel to South America as a pioneer wasn't that simple. My relatives and my friends were concerned, and they began to point out the dangers of a young woman going so far away alone. And it really was far, with no airplanes or radios, a few ships. <sighs> Much of Brazil was still untouched forest, and I knew no one. I didn't even speak a word of Portuguese. It was simply a leap in the dark. I felt my resolution weakening. That was when social work came up that I was doing in the northern part of New York State. And this gave me the idea to go to Montreal to consult with my dear friend, May Maxwell. When I arrived, I found May bedridden with sickness. But when she, even though she was ill, upon hearing about the situation, she sat upright in bed and in ringing tones, which still vibrate in my memory, said, Leonora, what are you waiting for? Go. And I replied, I'll take the next boat. And so I did. I had enough money saved up to pay for a second class ticket and to live at a hotel for approximately three weeks. I knew my father would send me money to come back home if needed, but not a penny to help extend my stay in South America. To my joy, Martha Root went to Boston and we had precious hours together. Seated in a hotel lobby, talking and praying. Later, with her wonderful generosity, Martha sent me an enormous trunk, large enough to hold all my books. And she said other things as well. Cutlery, bedding, 
even a small rug, and even other more precious gifts. Among them, a lock of hair from the head of Baha'u'llah. On January 15, 1921, I set sail from New York on the SES Uvasari. I made my first contact with Brazil on this ship with a young Brazilian girl, Ida Ains, who was returning to Brazil after studying for two years in the United States. Ida gave me my first lesson in Portuguese. And much more importantly, became interested in the faith and eager to see Abdu'l-Baha in Haifa. Everyone on this English ship was very kind. That is, those that I could meet in the second class. Even the cabin steward with his back up lassie at one moment when I was surprised with a fit of homesickness. All had the opportunity to hear about the Baha'i faith, although few became interested. At daybreak on February 1st, our ship entered the harbor of Rio de Janeiro, the most beautiful harbor I had ever seen. Gentle hues of rose and violet on the horizon at the beautiful Guanabara Bay. And soon after, the golden rays of the sunrise seemed to symbolize the dawn of a glorious new day. I, a solitary traveler, a 25-year-old young woman, aboard the Vasari steamboat, as we slowly approached the docks of Rio de Janeiro on that morning, However, when I disembarked, stepping for the first time on the soil of this vast Brazil, I felt my heart weaken and my courage waned. I watched at the other passengers embrace their relatives and friends who had been longing for their arrival. But no one was there waiting for me. I knew no one in the entire country. Except for the new friend I had met on board, Miss Ida. But still, there wasn't in any country in South America, even one declared or known Baha'i. The only person that had come to this continent to spread the cause was that stellar servant of Baha'u'llah, Martha Root, who had been in many cities sowing the seeds that the master Abdu'l-Baha assured would give fruit in the future. But it wasn't the time yet. Had I actually taken that step? Or was it just a bad dream? What in the end could I hope to do in this foreign land a different language and customs alone without resources or prestige or anything else? How could I learn a living and dedicate myself to spreading the cause? Then I remembered that I was not alone. For I had come to answer the call of Abdu'l-Baha. And had he not promised that whosoever arose to serve his cause, no matter their weakness or apparent lack of means, would be sustained through the power of the Holy Spirit.
As soon as I arrived in Rio de Janeiro, I wrote to Ângelo Guido, a theosopher from Santos, and waited for news to him, from him. My friend Aida helped me find suitable accommodations, which wasn't easy since it was not usual for a young woman of good character to travel alone. And to make matters worse, it happened to be on the eve of carnival. Aida even insisted on staying in the hotel with me at her own expense till I got word from Guido. While I waited for news from Santos, and since my funds were dwindling, Aida suggested find English students, but to no avail. So all my prospects weren't bright. We found a cheaper hotel, but even so, I couldn't wait much longer. And with each day that passed, my anxiety increased. At last, after anxiously waiting for 12 days, the telegram finally came telling me to proceed to Santos. I traveled in a little boat from the Costera line that rocked so much it was hard to avoid being seasick. Fortunately, the voyage was short. A young American woman traveling alone on a Brazilian boat, hmm, it was a curious thing at that time. And the other passengers of the little boat tried one after another to find out what my mission could be. Fortunately, thanks to dear Martha's efforts, we already had one booklet in Portuguese, a small one known as Number Nine or Little Ben. And this saved me my attempt to talk to people on this first trip on a Brazilian ship. Early in the morning, under torrential rain, we arrived in the harbor of Santos. I watched all the passengers disembarked and affectionately embraced their relatives and friends and then gradually disappear. I stood alone on the deck, waiting and contemplating the rain. What if this Angelo Guido doesn't show up? After all, to me, he was still only a name. After what I felt was a very long time, a slight figure under an enormous umbrella suddenly emerged from one corner of the deck. He was looking at me as if he thought that I might be the person he was looking for. And I was. Angel Guido's house was very modest. Located in a middle-class residential street far from the city center. As we entered, his young wife of Portuguese ancestry was sitting by a long and narrow dining table. Covered with a red tablecloth, and swarming with flies. At first she seemed a little cold, but she was polite. My bare little room, which looked out on the kitchen, was devoid of any comfort, and the food was indescribably poor. Things were different from anything I had known. But this didn't seem to be that important. Nor did the fact that I, instead of teaching Latin in a select private school, like Walnut Hill of Nautique, Massachusetts, I would be, I was to be a bookkeeper in a Ford agency and repair shop and have to give English lessons early every morning and for three hours at night besides the eight or nine hours at the agency. 
just to meet the expenses of room and board, without enough left to pay for the bus fare to and from work four times a day. These were difficult months. To one who knew nothing about bookkeeping, even in English, the office work was a nightmare. Especially since it included picking up the phone, over which Portuguese was even harder to understand. The heat was such as I had never felt before. And combined with the inadequate diet, made the walk back and forth at the lunch break under the scorching midday sun another ordeal. There was a tall palm tree at the corner of our street, and I would fix my eyes on it and say, I have to reach it no matter how weak I may feel. Only late in the evening, after my last class, I could retreat into my corner and with the family already gone to sleep, study Portuguese grammar and translate. Late into the evening. Sometimes it was hard to avoid seriously doubting how wise this step I had taken was. What could I, alone, the only Baha'i pioneer in all South America, hope to accomplish with so little time at my disposal? No funds, no prestige, no Baha'i literature in Portuguese, and with still almost no knowledge of the language of the country, how many times have I prostrated myself in my little room and begged Baha'u'llah to enable me to serve more efficiently? The prayer revealed by the Master for teachers in foreign countries seemed made for me. Oh God, I supplicated. Thou seest me, relying on thee, abandoning rest and comfort, a stranger fallen on the ground, supplicating thee in the dead of night, that thou mayest assist me in the exaltation of thy word. O oh Lord, strengthen my back and confirm me in thy servitude with all my powers and leave me not to myself in these regions. Alone at these times, I found comfort and hope in the words of Baha'u'llah. Verily, we behold you from our realm of glory and shall aid whosoever will arise for the triumph of our cause with the hosts of the concourse on high and a company of our favored angels. And as expected, soon after this, I was able to give up the office work in Santos, which had been taking so much of my time and energy. The number of English students had increased until I had enough to sustain myself. It was now possible to devote a few hours every day to translating, which made me very happy. I also found more and more opportunities to speak about the faith to people individually, although rarely to groups. It was then that I found out through Angelo Guido of a National Esperanto Congress that was to be held in Rio de Janeiro that April. And, at his suggestion, I wrote, asking for permission to make a presentation in Esperanto about the faith. 
I was anxious for any possible opportunity to spread the knowledge of the faith. After all, wasn't this the reason that I came to Brazil? But I must confess that deep down, I hoped that they would reject my request. Because to travel alone to Rio, still knowing so little Portuguese, and practically no Esperanto, to speak in a National Esperanto Congress, seemed to be a task beyond my powers. But my presentation was accepted and I had to face the challenge. I prepared a brief speech with great difficulty and with the help of a small Esperanto English dictionary. I translated word by word Fortunately, I had this dictionary that someone in the U.S. had given me. Since in Santos, I could find no Esperanto books. Or a single Esperantist to help me. To my infinite relief, after I had read my speech, the president said that I had given proof that Esperanto could be perfectly understandable even when spoken by people of different nationalities. And he said he was so interested in the faith that on his own initiative, he took me for an interview with the editor of O Journal, the leading newspaper, I think, which resulted in an article with a photograph of Abdul Baha in the Sunday edition. This was my first victory over my natural shyness. I had spoken in public. Just three months after my arrival in Brazil, I received the news of the passing of my dear maternal grandmother, the grandmother to whom I owed the great blessing of having received the Baha'i message, my spiritual mother. This news brought me an intense feeling of loss. I was baptized Leonora in her honor. My grandmother's name was Leonora Georgina Sterling. And she became a Baha'i when she was almost 80 years old, one of the first Baha'is of North America. I was 13 or 14 years old when my grandmother began explaining the faith to me and my sister. We memorized the hidden words and Baha'i prayers. And my grandmother played Baha'i hymns on our piano and taught us how to sing them. When Abdul Baha went to America, my grandmother was happy beyond belief. She attended the public meetings in New York City and also had a private interviews with Abdul Baha at one of which he pinned a big white rose on her coat. What a blessing. A few months after my dear grandmother's death and my grief deepened due to the passing of the master. It seemed almost impossible to accept the fact that in the end, I was never going to meet him in this life. The tablet which Abdul Baha had revealed for me in June of that year, so shortly before his passing, was a source of encouragement and inspiration for the rest of my life. 
In it, he addressed me as Herald of the Kingdom. And it contained such astonishing promises for the people of Brazil. He wrote, This heavenly assembly will day by day be enlarged. The intoxicated friends will grow in rapture and ecstasy. Will begin to break into melodies and harmonies and raise a tune that will reach the supreme concourse and rejoice and exhilarate the Holy Ones. I remember when on a gloomy, cloudy day, as I walked along a shabby street, a sudden wave of realization swept over me as I discerned a golden cross in the distance surmounting a church steeple. I thought of the early Christians who were so few, weak, and without prestige in the eyes of the world, yet they remained firm, undaunted by pearls and vicissitudes, knowing that through the power of the Holy Spirit, the cross would triumph. To the casual observer in the first century of our Christian era, it would undoubtedly seem impossible that the symbol of the faith of that handful of humble people could, after nearly 2,000 years, still surmount church steeples on the other side of the world. And nowadays, we Baha'is, though comparatively so few and weak in the eyes of the world, must have that same burning conviction that our cause will triumph through the power of the Holy Spirit. Do we not have the glorious promise made by Baha'u'llah that every sincere effort made in his cause would certainly bear fruits in the future, would aid in ushering a new world civilization, would hasten the coming of that golden age, the promise of all ages. Nothing of importance happened in that first year in Santos. I consumed my time with earning my living, studying Portuguese for long hours in my room at night. After my last student had left, and some attempts at translating the Baha'i literature. Now I understood why they guided me to specialize in Latin at the university. My only friend at that time was Dora Connor, who along with her mother nursed me through typhoid. Giving up their own room to me for four weeks and not letting anyone take me to the general hospital as people used to say that one only went there to die. I became weak and quite worried about the debt brought by the disease. But with the help of these ever devoted sisters, I got better. And during my recovery, Dora also assisted me in translating a small book by Thornton Chase. We had no time to waste. Shortly after this, my father sent me money to return to the United States. And as he supposed that there would never be another opportunity for it, he included enough money for a trip up the Amazon River, which used to be known as the most important thing to see in South America. 
By saving up, I managed to stretch the money so that I could visit for a few days or weeks or even months all the major cities on my way, especially Salvador Bahia, as given the importance Abdu'l-Bahá gave it. I always had a great desire to visit Salvador. When I arrived in this city, I went to the American consulate to fetch my mail. And the consul asked if I would like to teach his children for three months. In return for room and board, I know that it was an answer to my prayers. The way had opened for teaching the faith in this important city. The sea air and the food in this comfortable home helped me regain my strength. And as the classes were only in the morning, I had the rest of the day free for Baha'i work. My contact with the Theosophists in Salvador immediately opened a door. As they offered me their headquarters in the very center of the city, for weekly meetings. Posters were printed for distribution and the weekly meetings were announced in the newspapers. Many came and continued to come week after week. The first person to embrace the faith was a young Brazilian, Claudinor Luz. I always thought it was meaningful that the name of the first Baha'i was Luz, light. When the time came to leave Bahia, some friends arranged a special meeting to express their sympathy with Baha'i ideals. There was about 100 people present, and a program had been prepared with lectures and poems composed especially for the occasion. When I rose to speak and quoted some of the words of Abdu'l-Bahá, everyone stood and remained standing till I finished. And afterwards, they gave me some beautiful roses. I was filled with joy and gratitude that in this city of Bahia, so notably mentioned in the divine plan, Baha'u'llah used me as an instrument by attracting these sincere souls to the faith. From Bahia, I continued my travels and was able to stop at all the major cities on the coast, Aracaju, Maceo, Recife, Cabedelo, Natal, Fortaleza, San Luis, Belen, and Manaus. In all of these places, I found great receptivity. I was able to organize public talks and give interviews to newspapers. The first public talk in Manaus, for example, was attended by 800 people. And the second was at the Baptist Church, where there were about 3,000 present. The newspaper articles were excellent. As I look back on these experiences, I find myself asking, was it really the shy, timid Leonora, afraid to lift her voice in any gathering, who now talked with governors, parliament members, judges, and sat at the table with bishops and clerics. I can remember the fear and dread that I felt as I went to each lecture hall. The many times I repeated to myself the words of Abdu'l-Bahá. Oh God, put into my words 
a trace of the traces of thy supreme word, that the reality of all things may be attracted and drawn. And how fervently I prayed for strength. My so-called talks were little more than compilations of the words of Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l-Baha, essentially memorized, but each one was still an ordeal for me, and it was only the power of Baha'u'llah that sustained me. Finally, toward the end of 1922, I set sail from Para to New York. It would be hard to describe my happiness at seeing my loved ones once again, especially my sister and my closest and dearest Baha'i friends. And through the whole year spent in the United States, I took every opportunity to be with them. I returned to the last job I had before leaving for Brazil at the New York State Training School for Girls at Hudson. And I quickly got promoted. It was an engaging job, not to mention the excellent salary and the comfort of a private apartment in the institution. It was work that I really loved and it was hard to think of leaving it again. But the urge to go back to Brazil grew stronger and stronger within me. I realized that I had just started the process of teaching the cause in that immense country. There were new Baha'is who needed nurturing and so many areas still untouched with still virgin soil. All that I was able to do in the nearly two years spent in Brazil was less than a drop in the ocean of what we really needed to do. The letters Claudine or Luz sent me expressed the growing interest in the faith in Bahia and intensified my desire to continue the work in that city, mentioned so dearly by the Master. Thus, in December of 1923, I set out once more for Brazil, this time in the company of my beloved sister, Ali, and another pioneer, Maud Mikkel. On the trip back, I could reconnect with people I had met in Manaus, Berlin, Fortaleza, Recife, Maceo, and Rio de Janeiro. Every place we went, we were impressed with how receptive, cordial, and sincere the people were. We were upset that we could not stay longer. From Rio, my sister returned to her work in the United States and Maud and I continued up to Bahia, where we intended to establish residence. In April of 1924, we arrived in Salvador, Bahia, with pitifully depleted funds. So, our priority was to rent the first and cheapest little house we could find. We needed at least one chair for each to sit on, one table, and two straw mattresses. The house we found in Rio Vermelho had a cement floor with no ceiling lining and to our disappointment, no inside bathroom or stove. The steep hill was so muddy and slippery as to be a little dangerous on dark and rainy nights. Soon, as soon as our financial situation permitted, we moved to the city center, renting the entire second floor of a building on Hua Chile, the most important street 
in the upper city. Hence, the best possible location for Baha'i meetings. We commissioned a large signboard with Baha'i Center, which attracted considerable attention. Newspapers also announced our weekly meetings, and many came. Two medical students, attracted by the sign, were instrumental for one of the most critical contacts we made with a group of factory workers in Calzada, one of the poorer sections on the outskirts of town. There we held weekly meetings and many people became Baha'i. Among those simple, humble, but sincere and devoted people, 22 signed a letter to the Guardian in 1925 expressing their sympathy with the faith and loyalty to him and asking for prayers for their spiritual growth. According to present-day standards, we should have formed a local assembly at that time, but I hesitated. I thought that a clearer understanding of the station of Baha'u'llah was necessary. It was a grave mistake that I always regretted. In 1940, many years later, a local spiritual assembly was finally formed in Bahia, composed mainly of those simple people from Calzada. But the victories were followed by crises and difficulties as we passed through disheartening phases. The attendance at our meetings became smaller and the local organization that supported us at first seemed to lose interest. This crisis made me conscious of how much I lacked, of my utter inadequacy and unworthiness to remain in that pioneering post. The Guardian wrote me explaining that pioneer work always has difficult beginnings and slow results. But the seeds we have so lovingly and devotedly sown will never be lost nor completely die. He told me that working earnestly, even with no apparent results, and teaching the cause to cold and indifferent people is no easy or encouraging task. Only those fortified by an unshakable faith and courage born of the burning fire of conviction can stand it. It was only thanks to the constant encouragement of the guardian that I stayed. The master referred to me as herald of the kingdom. But I think it wasn't because I deserved that title, but because he saw that I might become that herald only if I could arise. I am conscious that my utter lack of self-confidence has roots in my childhood. I was five, and my sister Alethe had just turned three years old when our mother died. It was a tragedy for us all, but our father was the most affected. He became utterly unstable. 
we never again had a place we could truly call home. How could we endure through those years of our childhood and adolescence such loneliness, such suffering, and even cruelty? I don't know. A few accidents happened caused by my father's negligence and sometimes by his alcohol abuse and by a hairbreath we escaped from being seriously injured or even killed. It seemed that we, our lives were spared for some purpose. I can remember how back when I was still a small child before going to bed at night, I would often kneel at the bedside and with an anguished soul, with all my being, implore God to let us feel his presence, his nearness, his protection. I could never have dreamed then the way and how specially I would receive the answer to my prayers. Oh, how deeply grateful I am to Baha'u'llah for all the guidance and support that I always received, initially from the Master himself, Abdu'l Baha, through his tablets, then by the Guardian, and later from the beloved Universal House of Justice. Many have tried to describe the beloved Guardian. I will not. But I'll only say that when I was on pilgrimage in the Holy Land, I was awed, overwhelmed by the spiritual majesty of His presence, His love and purity. On the ninth day of the pilgrimage, the day set for my departure, the greatest holy leaf was sitting near the door. I knelt down before her in tears while she gently and lovingly stroked my hair. Shoghi Effendi was standing just outside, waiting to say goodbye. He said, when you return to Bahia, Remember that the most important work is the direct teaching. The second is translation. And the third is social service, if you have the time. See, the most vital work is the direct teaching. And then he placed in my hand tiny vial of rose oil with which to anoint the true believers of Brazil. It hasn't been easy to recall these events of the first years lived in South America. As I look back to those years so rich in opportunities to sow the seeds of the faith, I feel that our harvest 
could have been far more abundant if only I had attained a greater degree of resignation, a higher dedication, putting aside all other considerations, letting no personal problems, sorrows, serious illnesses, accidents, or other vicissitudes come into my place. If I had been more on fire, if I just kept in mind the words of Baha'u'llah, Arise thou in my name among my servants, and say, He came to thee. Arise thou in my name above the horizon of renunciation. And how often I prayed in the words of Abdul Baha, keep all my words of prayer and praise confined to one refrain. Make all my life but servitude to thee. It is a joy to see at least the beginning of the fulfillment of those words of Abdu'l Baha in his tablet to Martha Root in 1920. Praise be to God, the call of the kingdom has been received in South America, and the seeds have been sown in those cities and regions. Certainly, the heat of the sun of reality the rain of the eternal bounty and the breeze of the love of God will make them germinate. Have confidence. And how happy I am recalling the words of the beloved guardian, which he said to me so many years ago. Remember that the time will surely come when Bahia and the whole of Brazil will joyously respond to and universally recognize the call of Yah Baha'u'llah Pa. O Bahá'í 
é uma pessoa que considera o mundo como um só país e todos os seres humanos seus cidadãos, que vê em todo semelhante um irmão que ama a Deus e a seu próximo, sem distinção de a cor, ou classe, ou crença ou nacionalidade. Ama a Deus e dedica sua vida a servir a Deus, servindo a humanidade, amando a todos. E qual a finalidade da sua visita? A finalidade é difundir a mensagem de Bahá'u'llá. Yabahaw, 